Hello everyone. This is chapter two of When Sleeping Giants Wake and it's called Friendly Advice. That afternoon, Primrose played her harp again and Plumpton and Aunt Betty jigged around the room. Primrose had felt much better after her talk with Plumpton and he was also mightily relieved. Things were going to go well again at Plumpton Cottage. But, as anyone who's ever met a goblin will tell you, they don't give up easily. And that night, as Primrose was sitting on her bed brushing her hair, a raspy little voice called out. You stupid, stupid giant. So, you don't like me, eh? Well, perhaps it's time I introduce my friends to you. Maybe you like them better. <laughs> and with a vicious laugh and a bang on the outside wall, the voice disappeared. Plumpton could tell immediately that something was wrong, as he walked into the room to find Primrose wringing her hands and looking dismayed. He's been here again, hasn't he? Bedlam the bully. Yes, he has, and oh dear, I think I've really started something now, said Primrose. He said he's going to bring his friends. Oh no, I am frightened now, Plumpton. He might have hundreds of horrible friends. Whatever will we do? Don't you worry, Primrose. He's not the only one with friends, and I think it's time we called on ours. Oh, but won't they be angry with me, Plumpton? Won't they think it's all my fault? Not at all, Primrose. They'll be angry with that little troublemaker. He's a bully who doesn't even show his face. He'll run away for sure when he's outnumbered. Bertha and Buttertubs have seen him off at least once before, so have Rumbled and Rabina. I'm sure they'll be only too happy to come and help. The next morning, Primrose and Plumpton sat writing out invitations to their friends. When they'd finished, Plumpton went outside and whistled sharply three times, and within a few minutes, Ruby, the red kite, came swooping down and landed gracefully on Plumpton's arm. Soon Ruby was off with the first invitation to the Yorkshire Giants Jamboree, which could have been titled A Battle with Bedlam, but sounded much more inviting as a jamboree or musical extravaganza. First on the list were the nearest giants, Rombold and Rabina, the giants of Ilkley Moor. Ruby drops the invitation off down the chimney of their quarry home and then pecked noisily against the window to make sure they knew they'd had a delivery. The invitation was greeted with delight, as giants are quite sociable creatures, despite often spending many days alone. Rabina set to work at once baking a cake to take with them, as sharing food is an important part of giants' get-togethers, especially a jamboree. Rombold gathered together the other items he'd need to take, blankets for the stayover, and his mouth organ, and Rabina's tambourine. He found a soft cloth and began to polish the musical instruments, as the music making at a jamboree has to look as good as it sounds. Within the hour they were striding across Blubberhouse's Moor on the way to Plumpton's. Meanwhile Ruby had been back to Plumpton Cottage numerous times as each invitation required a separate trip to pick up the letter in her beak and then deliver it. Most of the Yorkshire Giants were well known to Ruby as she passed messages between them many times and was often rewarded with a tasty morsel as a thank you. From Buttertubs and Bertha in the north to Barnsley and Penny Pie in the south. From Runswick and Stamford in the east to Hebden and Howarth in the west, her speed was such that Ruby could deliver to all of them in one afternoon. Barnsley and Penny Pie in Hebden had to travel through dense areas, dense with little people, so they would have to travel by night. But Rombold, Rabina, Armscliff, Buttertubs and Bertha set off across the moors soon after receiving their invitations. First to arrive at Plumpton Cottage were Rombold and Rabina. Rabina pulled the cake tin out of her basket, lifted the lid with a flourish and presented it to Primrose with a smile. Aunt Betty sprang up from her seat to greet Rombold and Rabina and declared, Why, thank you, my dear. That's a very fine attempt at a cake. She then whisked, whisked it away into the kitchen to sit in attendance to her much more, much bigger, more elaborate cake, enjoying pride of place on the cake stand. Rabina followed her into the kitchen and looked crestfallen to see her cake 
playing a minor role on the table. She quickly turned heel and went over to speak to Primrose before Aunt Betty could indulge in any one-upmanship. Primrose was a sweet girl, thought Rabina. Not a show-off like her aunts, but she lacked the strength and determination of the other giants. How have you been, my dear? Have you settled in at last? Not missing Tiddington too much, are you? Oh, yes and no. Well, I mean, yes. I've settled very well, thank you, said Primrose, rather primly. Well, don't stand for any nonsense, you know, said Rabina. You have to let him know as boss. Primrose blinked and looked startled. Surely Plumpton hadn't told their friends about Bedlam just yet. Primrose blushed and looked to the ground. Well, you look proper sheepish, love. Has he been bossing you around? I'll come round with my rolling pin and sort him out if he has. Primrose's jaw dropped. She wasn't quite sure how to respond to this. Do, do you mean Plumpton? she stammered. Who else would I mean? You've not moved in with the lovesick cowboy, have you? What? I'm joking, my love. Of course I mean Plumpton. Who else would I mean? Did I hear my name being bandied about? It was called Plumpton as he moved across the room to greet Rabina. Yes, you did, you big oaf, said Rabina, making plimp Primrose cringe. Are you mistreating this young lady? She looks worried to death. Well, there's a story to that, said Plumpton. I was going to tell you when everyone had arrived. Well, I think you should tell me now, insisted Rabina. And so Plumpton, being an obliging sort of giant, told Rabina about Bedlam and his nasty antics around Primrose. At least, I think it's Bedlam, but I've no actual proof, concluded Plumpton. Nothing to think about. It's that little creep, all right, stated Rabina. Terrorising and bullying the weak and vulnerable, it has his mark all over it. Primrose was a little taken aback at being referred to as weak and vulnerable. I need to change, she thought. I need to be more like the Yorkshire Giants. They're so fearless and brave. I feel so foolish now. As if reading her mind, Plumpton put his arm across her shoulders and gave a reassuring squeeze. Why don't you tell us how you dealt with Bedlam, said Plumpton to Rabina. I've heard that you've seen him off before now. Indeed I did, said Rabina, signalling to Rombold to come and join them on the comfortable seating around the hearth. Didn't I see off that creep, Bedlam Rombold, when he came looking for trouble? Rabina addressed her husband. You certainly did, my dear, said Rombold. No help from me required. Primrose piped up then. You're so brave, Rabina, all of you are. Oh, if only I was a proper-sized giant, I'd be brave too, and Bedlam wouldn't be able to hurt me. Fiddlesticks, said Rabina. It's nothing to do with size, it's all to do with confidence. This is what my mother taught me to remember. Confidence. Confidence is made up of three parts. Con reminds us it's all a con. Most things that scare you are a trick, a confidence trick. Bedlam and his kind have no more power than we do. They just try to make us think they do. And FID stands for fiddlesticks. You've got to say fiddlesticks to what silly ninnies think and say. Give them no heed at all. When you think about them, you make them stronger. And finally, the ENS, confidence, stands for sense. Get a sense of who you are. You're a giant, for goodness sake. Large or small, you're still bigger and better than any other creature. Your great uncle was Uncle Shakespeare, the cleverest giant who's ever lived. Your grandparents roamed this land before the little people were created. They made the beautiful gardens and melodious music of history. Exactly, my dear. I couldn't have said it better myself, exclaimed Rombold. Yes, that bedlam needs to get back to Boggle Hole where he belongs. Show him you're frightened and he'll be back tormenting you every day. Well, I, I am frightened. I don't know how to disguise it, uttered Primrose. Just get on with your day, said Rombold. Pay him no heed, like Rabina said. Sing as if you're happy and soon you will be. 
Well, you could do the other thing I've done, said Rabina. All eyes turned to her expectantly. Well, when he came stalking around our quarry, calling me ugly, I said, ugly? You bet I'm ugly. And you ain't seen nothing yet, you little creep. Another word from you and I'll marmalise you. And then I rolled up my sleeves and I went to get my rolling pin. He'd gone by the time I came back to the door. Plumpton and Primrose burst out laughing at the thought as Rombold nodded his head knowingly and even Aunt Betty gave a grudging smile. And there we have Ruby the Red Kite taking the invitations off. And that's the end of chapter two. Chapter three will follow.